Whether subtle or obvious, spiritual abuse is a form of trauma that undermines your relationship with yourself and with God. How do we begin to unravel the harm caused by spiritual abuse, reclaim our spirituality, and regain healthy relationships with ourselves, others, and God? Hi, I'm Rachel Clinton Chen, a trauma specialist and co-host of the Allender Center podcast. Last year, I led an online seminar called Confronting Spiritual Abuse. We've had so many requests to make this content available again, so for a limited time, you can access the recording from this seminar. Enrollment is open through June 30th, 2022, and you'll have access to the material for the rest of the calendar year to work through at your own pace. In confronting spiritual abuse, you'll spend time understanding spiritual abuse in context, the systems, processes, and people who perpetrate it. You'll also learn to identify and name the abuse and learn ways in which you can start to heal. We believe that healing is possible. By doing this work, you can begin to reclaim spiritual beliefs and practices and reconnect with God and others in a deeper way. Visit theallendercenter.org slash online dash courses to enroll in confronting spiritual abuse today. Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Well, Dan, we are back today. talk a little bit more about spiritual abuse. And I think, you know, I'm just aware, I've been thinking a lot about our last conversation that we had. um, And I know today we're going to jump in a little bit more to some of the impact of spiritual abuse and, and maybe even begin to think through what healing is possible. Um, But anytime I talk about this, especially the more I talk about it, I can talk about it. um, And it still stirs up so much in my body because the reality is, Spiritual abuse is inherently embodied. (laughs) It is a very, any abuse is happening in our body. And I think when we hear a word like spiritual, it can almost feel like, oh, this is happening to like our disembodied soul, which I think is a part of what we've come to believe because of spiritual abuse. Or this is happening to, you know, my spirituality as if that's something separate from our personhood and our bodies and how we understand ourselves. And so I just want to name again that I really do come to this material with a lot of deep convictions with my own story. It stirs up so much in my body. It stirs up so many memories. Um, And I really long, like the reason I do this and I still call myself a Christian, I do think there's a place for like dismantling and deconstructing things. But for me, I do this because I really do believe the good shepherd is real Mm. and is working on our behalf and longs to redeem and longs to reveal himself, God's self, the spirit. And so I think I just, as we begin today, I just want to name, this is really tender ground. And for many Mm -hmm. people... Um, they might really be in the thick of it where this feels really new, really raw, incredibly overwhelming. And, you know, we're going to lean more into this, but I think just as a start, because it's so embodied, the nature of spiritual abuse is so isolating. And we talked about distorting, right? And I would even use words like it's disordering. And because fear and shame are such primary tools The way it manifests in our bodies is to create a profound distrust of our own gut, of our own sense of interpretation, our own sense of making meaning, because so much of the abuse is you are not trustworthy. Your gut, Mm -hmm. your body is bad. You don't know God like I do. You don't have the capacity to read the scriptures like I do. Like there's knowledge I have that you don't have. So I think I just want to start off by offering some compassion to where you might find yourself in a place that it feels like to even enter this conversation feels so overwhelming because you don't have imagination that you'll be able to see clearly ever again. 
because things are so fragmented and foggy and you don't know what to trust or how, you know, things that were once, like you said in the, our last conversation, once so sacred have been marred, have been used against you. And, and I think there's just a lot of grief there and there's a lot of fear still there. So as we step in today to talk more about the impact of spiritual abuse and what some of the hope for healing might be. I just hold that really tender ground that this is, this can be so deeply personal. Yes. And again, we could go through a handful of topics um, from sexuality to gender, to evolution, uh, to the role uh, of the church in society, culture, uh, the issue of American exceptionalism, nationalism, racism, and say, <laughs> and as we as we build a list of topics that are so called hot topics, the, the, you know, I, I haven't been on the road a lot, but I am starting to get back out there. And uh, in a recent trip, a uh, person, and I'll use the word cornered. And it's my judgment, I felt cornered. And I can say mm -hmm. I felt cornered because the person's tone from the very beginning was, I, I really want to know what your view is on, and let me just use X. Well, I really want you to know your view on X. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, um, I have like a few minutes between when I start teaching again, and I actually need to go to the bathroom. So let me give you a beginning. And it's like, when I began, the person said, oh, Literally, oh, so you're a, and I'll not use the next several phrases, but basically a liberal who doesn't really believe in the Bible. Right. And I, I'm like, uh, the presence of contempt and judgment that corners a person and boxes them in, I, I felt in that moment, I'm not going to, I, I'm not sure I want to use the term spiritual abuse, but it felt that. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like, I can't have a conversation with you because you've already judged me. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think with you about, yeah, there's a lot in life. I, uh, my views have changed on many things, including uh, the role of husband, wife, and marriage, et cetera, and, and complementarianism versus egalitarianism. There are so many things that we are rethinking in that process, but in the cornering and the contempting. Uh, I, I felt literally, uh, the phrase I used when I talked to Becky on the phone is, I just got slapped in the face. Mm -hmm. And anytime you get slapped in the face is a form of abuse. In this case, spiritual abuse. I'd love to have you just sort of think with me, <laughs> am I putting words to what you would put? Yeah, I mean, I, you're bringing a certain type, I think, of, it honestly just reminds me of Jesus's interactions with the religious leaders of his day, where they're constantly cornering him and trying to put him in a box and trying to expose him, you know, as a certain thing that is contrary to the systems, which obviously Jesus was the ultimate one who was exposing their own self-righteousness and hypocrisy and misuse of God's story, God's people, God's power. Um, so I definitely think, you know, I'm assuming you're wanting to talk a little bit about, again, that spectrum of abusers. You're wanting to go I back am. there? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I need help. Yes. Yeah. I mean, again, as we're talking about... Uh, really self I mean ultimately for me when I think about spiritual abuse it's like we are in the realm of a spirit of religion which often is contrary to the kingdom of God right um it and it's close enough that you think you're really living faithfully into the kingdom of God but you are bound to systems of power that will always be contrary to God so when I hear this person I think oh they're so afraid they're so afraid of something that you are deeply threatening to them. And I, again, Jesus is constantly being interacted with as if he is deeply threatening, which I think he was deeply threatening to the systems of power and death that, that maintain the world's order. And so to me, yes, the impact of spiritual abuse is a direct assault on our capacity to have faith, 
our capacity to hope and our capacity to love. And that assault comes mm-hmm. through distortion, exploitation, and weaponizing of good things that we're meant for. And, you know, I'm just so grateful to you, Dan, for over many years putting such profound language and understanding to these categories for me that they've become so much more than like cognitive ideas or cognitive assent to something. So, you know, the way we would talk about faith really is the sense of like a memory of the goodness of God, of, of good attunement and attachment and rest, like knowing that we are meant for goodness and flourishing and not just in our individual selves, but that that's ultimately God's desire and dream for the whole of creation, for all tribes and nations, that there would be a flourishing, a a capacity for rest, a capacity to receive God's goodness. And unfortunately we live in a world where that has been so disrupted Um, by evil. And we live in ramifications of that. But what's so wicked and insidious is when Mm -hmm. someone who proclaims to be faithful is using faith as a weapon. So where faith becomes really dogmatic and, um, and a blind, I mean, we talked about this, a blind loyalty to someone's truth, right? Because it's usually being interpreted, interpreted and given, um, like where did we come to believe that faith was the absence of doubt or questions? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, it's such an important category that I, I, I know that if folks have been listening to us for a while, they can almost predict I'm going to return to the Psalms. But it is one of those places where I'm so grateful that our God causes David, but others, to pen questions as part of worship. Mm -hmm. And the notion that doubt in and of itself is a destroyer of faith. Uh, I see it as the building block to engaging what the heart really is wrestling with. So that kind of rigidity, I think always within the realm of systems, um, persons that have a kind of you know you cross this little line, you are going to pay for it. Um, That has a kind of inherent, even though I think those folks would tend to say, oh, we're deeply committed to the Bible, deeply committed to the Word of God. Um, What, again, I would say is, do you understand that people differ with you? Um, and, And maybe radically. So how do you come to the engagement with people who do love Jesus, pursuing Jesus, and have a very different view, do you anathematize them? Um, And if you do, already what feels like, uh, shall we say, is some of the energy of all forms of spiritual abuse is self-righteousness. Oh, absolutely. And it's so tragic because you're, you're, I mean, that's the the seduction and trap of self-righteousness is we're so convinced we're right and good and everyone else is wrong. And we're like so far outside of the fruit of the spirit, but we can't see it. And we think we're doing a good deed, a good thing by reprimanding people, by judging people, by shaming people. And, you know, it's just, I just go back to like, if God is big enough and kind enough and patient enough to not only bear my questions, but to invite them. Mm-hmm. Why would I want to follow someone who says, well, no, God actually can't tolerate any of these and you're in trouble. Like yeah. when the story itself says, you know, there's space for your full humanity. <laughs> and sometimes our questions and our anger and our, crying out are the most faithful responses we can have if we truly believe God is good. Mm-hmm. And I don't think God is needs us to like defend God, you know, but we, we get in those traps. But I also think about, you know, where hope gets distorted and hope becomes optimism. You know, again, you talked about that spiritual bypassing, right? Like um, hope becomes all things work to the good of those who love God, but at the worst time and without any other context of what God says about suffering and our pain and 
oppression and heartache, you know, um, or where hope becomes, this is your word, and I think it's a brilliant word, a kind of exceptionalism. exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. um, because exceptionalism only lets a few people be exceptional. And that will just <laughs> never be like God's true vision. If only a few people get to be exceptional at the expense and cost of every everyone else and at the exploitation and oppression of other people. So exceptionalism, though it may provide a false sense of safety, it may provide privileges that keep us feeling as if we are in the good graces of God, it will keep us far from the life we're most meant to live, like in the kingdom of God. And it will keep oh, us like so afraid, I think. Hmm. I was in a context not long ago where uh, a person who has a ministry uh, near Ukraine was sharing something of the work that they're doing to feed and house, and it's beautiful. Uh, I am, I am for every work that's engaging that heartbreaking satanic mm -hmm. assault against the people of Ukraine. However. You knew I was going to a however, mm -hmm. right? It did. Um, this really good person uh, began saying, you know, God has really been good protecting the people we're serving. And uh, what I wanted to say is, yes, that is wonderful. But are you aware there are others that are dying, that are not, quote unquote, being protected by God? that also love God. So I'm glad your ministry is serving, but it's also no assurance that by serving well, you will keep people from being harmed. And there was an implicit promise that as you give money to this work, mm -hmm. God is so at work that he's protecting his people from harm. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you go further and deeper, indeed, there is a protection ultimately of their life, their story, their their very being in this life and beyond. But you cannot be assured that in a kind of exceptionalism that if you trust this, your life will work. If you trust this, great financial gain will come. And again, it's a whole theological approach that uh, I, I would call deeply into question. And that is the so your faith and greater good will mm -hmm. come. There is a truth to mm -hmm. that, but not necessarily that you will be kept from pancreatic cancer, right. that uh, a Russian bomb will will somehow um, explode and others will suffer, but not you. And in that kind of false hope, you're almost again given this position of elitism. You are so special, you are so important, and you will be so profited by being in our midst that if you depart, the implication is great destruction will come. Mm -hmm. Bill Gothard used to offer this notion of the umbrella, that if, as long as you're under the umbrella of authority, essentially no harm will come. But if harm comes, it's an absolute proof you have been so, outside yes, of the that's umbrella. That's the important nuance, right? Because I don't – and you're not saying – it's. It's good for us to want to believe God wants to provide, that grace is for us, that provision is for us. It's it's that shadow side of, but if those things don't come, if you are sick, if you are suffering, if there are hardships you're facing, you must have done something to fall outside of the grace of God, to fall outside of the umbrella. Um, so you better stay close and you better not mess up, which I then think leads to the war on love when we're in spiritually abusive context, relationships, and processes. That something that's actually meant to liberate us, that's meant to be mutual, that's meant to um, help, is that giving and receiving of pleasure. It is the pursuit of justice and mercy and humility. It's the capacity to repair. That's what love is. It's the capacity to want to build provision that extends beyond the chosen, right? Like that actually changes the world. But in spiritually abusive contexts, love is demanded. Loyalty is demanded. And often, regardless of whether or not what you're being given in return is actually good, honoring, holy, right, 
um, or from God. So someone could be harming you, abusing you like explicitly, but however, you ought, you've got to forgive them. You've got to love them. They're hu- They get to be human, but you don't. And I think it's that feeling of, again, your word and a really good one bondage, um, where you once, and that's the tricky part of it, right? Because like you're saying, so often we find ourselves in these contexts because there's something really good being offered to us that we're hungry for. We've been read well. Our places of deficit, our places of longing are being met initially, but in a way that then sets us up that we feel like that we won't get that goodness anywhere else. So we mm-hmm. should probably stay. And then if you have kind of fear and manipulation involved, you know, to leave, and at some point to leave is, if you're in a spiritually abusive context, often those are your primary relationships because everything becomes so insular. So it's not like you're just leaving an abuser, you're leaving a full community sometimes, whether that's a school, a nonprofit, uh, you know, a political system, a family system. And the biggest fear that you are going to lose God. Because your Mm -hmm. relationship with God has been proximated through these people. Like they're almost have become the mediator. Instead of Jesus being the actual (laughs) mediator and intercessor and like perfecter of, of all who you are in God, it's like people or processes or systems have. So to lose them really does feel in our bodies like we are going to lose God. And I think that's Mm -hmm. often why so many of us stay because we can almost bear some of those other things. I mean, they would be brutal, but we can bear them. If we lose God, it feels like I'm not going to survive. And Mm -hmm. to me, that is, I just, I feel such heartache and such rage um, that God's love is distorted in that way because the God I know has said there really is, like, you could run to the farthest ends of the earth and there's really nowhere you could run outside of the the width and breadth and depth of my love. You could be in the darkest of night and even that darkness is still light to me. Like, I will find you. And it's where we have this juxtaposition of, like, the really bad shepherd, like in Ezekiel 34, in John 10, 10, juxtaposed with the good shepherd who will do anything to bring lost sheep home and not just lost because they haven't encountered God. I often think exiled because they've been so harmed and heavy burdened. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we won't delineate it to this degree, but I'm curious what, what you would do is what's the effect on your body Mm. of faith that is offered as dogmatism as hope that is uh, at least initially a, a form of exceptionalism or love that actually uh, is a constraint and a bondage, mm-hmm. not a freedom and flourishing. Uh, what What's it done to your body? Oh, this is where I'm like, well, all the effects of actual abuse that sometimes really doesn't matter what kind of abuse it is. If it's abusive, it seems to have some more impact. So I think exhaustion, like it's such a lose-lose setup. There's really never, there's never going to be enough you can do to like make it in, in the ways you feel like you have to make it in to be good enough, to be worthy of love, to be worthy of belonging be worthy of leadership. I think it demands a kind of splitting off of your personhood because being human is incredibly messy and complex. (laughs) I don't know why. I'm just like, yes. Oh, yes. Preach it. It is just messy. And and if you add being someone who's well acquainted with abuse or trauma, that, that mess gets even messier because there's a lot of fragmentation there's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of confusion in our bodies. So I think for me, that's often like in spiritually abusive context, oftentimes the ways in which your messiness is actually reflecting where you need healing and hope gets only recoded as sin, moral failure. Again, a lack of faith, a lack of hope, a lack of love. So it's we're in that realm. And Jesus is so clear, so, so, so clear 
to those who teach and preach and have spiritual authority, like, woe to you. It's like the only time in the Bible you see Jesus use, like, very scary woe language is to spiritual leaders. And he uses language like, it would be better for you to have a stone wrapped around your neck and thrown into a lake than to, like, cause these little ones to stumble. Um Woe to you who heap heavy burdens on already burdened people. So I think the impact on our bodies is is a lot of exhaustion, a lot of shame and contempt. Like, why can't I just get it right? Why can't I stop sinning? Why can't I believe? Like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just believe? And I think I remember being in seasons where it just felt like my anxiety, which actually was a truth teller. Like, red alert, red alert, something's wrong. And I'm like, my body is a betrayer. It's a sinner. It's against me. It can't be trusted. Why can't I just change my cognitive thinking to be more faithful, to believe more? Like, there must be something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. So that contemptuous, like, shameful kind of, it's, it is like having, like, rocks, like, tied onto your back and... So then you're working double as hard to achieve something that ultimately you're never going to be able to achieve if shame and contempt and fear are the primary tools being used against you. They will set you up. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also would just say, um, yeah, like I, I named like that profound distrust of our bodies and being cut off from our own inner compass, like our own... Um, the places where we actually do it, we do like our bodies do tell us when we are in the presence of God and really receiving what we're wired for, because we are wired for love. That's how God made us. So we actually do know in our bodies when there's good attunement, you know, good care that's honoring of our personhood, that it offers safety, but also offers autonomy We know when we're in the presence of someone who has humility and a capacity to bring good repair, to own when they've harmed and say, I'm going to do better. But in spiritual abusive context, because the harm is not just being brought by people, but ultimately it feels like it's being brought by God. Those, that capacity to read those things gets really distorted because God really becomes like a punisher and someone who's constantly angry with us and and dissatisfied with us and disappointed in us and demanding more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Well, we know this to be true, and that is trauma is inevitable. But a lot of people that I've worked with who have been significantly capital T trauma, spiritual abuse, um, have other abusive Absolutely. stories. And at some level, uh, if I can put it this way, physical abuse doesn't have a lot of subtlety. Emotional abuse, uh, generally speaking, doesn't have a lot of subtlety. You know, being called names is not subtle. Mm -hmm. Being slapped Mm -hmm. in the face, being physically beaten, it's not subtle. When you get into the realm of sexual abuse, when it's very overt, uh, it, it has very little subtlety. But there's a lot of sexual abuse that um, uh, we we often code with the word inappropriate. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, there is something more clear. Often spiritual abuse seems like it has a longer season of subtlety. And if you have a history of abuse where you have learned to bear the burden, to shut your body down, to split off, to bear up under the exhaustion and keep going, then in some ways it's harder to actually name spiritual abuse because, as you put it, our bodies are not ready to name it. And the moment we name it, we're excluded to some degree by our community and powerful authority figures. But what you've put words to just feels so – I mean, even as you say it, I can almost feel like, like pain in my chest, and that is I have lost God, Mm -hmm. and I am at every level now um, an orphan, Mm -hmm. a stranger, a widow. I am am without, and that feels like for at least a lot of 
prior abused men and women, it, it almost feels like not only too much, but not that big of a deal to keep enduring spiritual mm -hmm. abuse. So as we move to this, just I want to kind of at least get a few yeah. categories of how does a person just even begin to name that they're in with a person or with a family or with a process or system that's actually depriving yeah. them, not only of dignity, but in some ways is violating that beautiful Matthew 11, my burden, mm -hmm. my yoke uh, is easy, my burden is light. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much I could say about this. So I will just give a little plug that we are going to be re-releasing the Confronting Spiritual Abuse webinar that we did in June. It's going to be re-released over the next couple of weeks and people will have access to the remainder of the year. So there's just a lot more time and space to talk about things there. But I will just say this, I believe that God is good and God is real and, and that God is a pursuer who honors our dignity and our personhood and wants to bring restoration. So I wish there was a way to move toward healing from spiritual abuse that didn't involve some kind of wilderness, but I've yet to find it. <laughs> and I, I think it's important to name wilderness is not without provision. It's not without connection. And sometimes it's not without like community. Um, but I do think part of the, like some of the first steps of healing are like a, it can often be a leaving and a kind of boundary setting, um, a separation or even like a sabbatical space where it's just taking a step back, letting the noise quiet a little bit. And again, that can be so hard to do because there will be a lot that comes against you if you step outside of the system. Um, but because there has to also be space, um, there like healing takes time. And I am someone who believes that healing can be simultaneous. Like I am a both and kind of person. So like I have experienced moments of divine deliverance where God knows like what I need needs to happen quickly, swiftly, and pretty profoundly. But even that divine deliverance in like a moment where liberation can kind of come. Example, I do a spiritual abuse podcast with you. <laughs> and there's a little bit of like a divine intervention of like, this is your life. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't eliminate the need for an ongoing healing process. Um, that takes time. And you can't heal from spiritual abuse without engaging your body. And that's where some of the wilderness comes in because it's hard to trust community and connection if you don't trust yourself. And this is where I do think the spirit is very generous and very gracious and will rise to the occasion to help us be born again, um, to do some of that laboring work on our behalf. And so it, I think it's actually a pretty profound leap of faith to say, I'm going to leave this abusive context. And again, the caveat is for so many people that can't happen overnight. That has to have a strategic plan in place. For some people, it's their place of work. For some people, so much of their life is wrapped up into it that they need time to untangle. And there's, so there's no judgment about the timeline. It's just at some juncture, there has to be reasserting boundaries of your life that actually begin to honor your personhood that you are good and loved and beloved. Again, does that mean you're not needing to do a lot of healing and integrative work on places that are really broken? No, that like our brokenness doesn't get to eclipse the fact that we are loved by God and that we're meant for goodness. Um, I, I think finding your voice and, and re like letting the truth take up residence in your body. And that, that might include a long season of lament where there is a waking up to the harm you've experienced and it might lead to a season of anger and both like grief and anger both might be true and they might dance together and they might take turns but like what what do you love what brings you joy can you reclaim what it is to actually taste the goodness of life in the land of the living and remember that you do have more wisdom you do have more capacity for joy. You do actually have a capacity to discern what's true and what is profoundly untrue. And that might mean 
some commitment to therapy. It might mean some commitment to body work. It might mean some commitment to a small group of people that you've developed a trust with. Um, again, who are committed to the long goal of healing. Because we can kind of take these detours of like, we just want to, you know, kind of react to the thing we left. And like, sometimes we got to hang out there for a little bit. But if that's where we stop, I think that can, in some ways, almost become its own self-righteous little enclave. Mm -hmm. And then I think just, again, that movement towards finding your people. Um, And I think that's what can be really profound in seasons of wilderness is we are more available to find people like, you know, for me coming out of my first season of wilderness led me to the Seattle school and some random kind of like, I don't know what to do with my life. I'll Google, you know, seminaries cause I at least like to study God. So maybe I can start there. Um, so I, I just think there has to be both a lot of intentionality and that radical belief that the spirit of God is at work on our behalf and grace is grace. It has come and is coming and will continue to come, but not without like some experience of wilderness and loss mm-hmm. and reclaiming. Uh, I, again, I can't summarize any better than you already have, but that sense of y- you're not going to address the reality or the harm of spiritual abuse without having, in some ways, an initial cost that may feel worse than the cure. Mm -hmm. And yet, in being willing to walk uh, into the wilderness, it's going to challenge and at some level deconstruct something of what you have likely believed. And yet, as you're open to the process of, of trust being reformed, and as the capacity to risk as hope begins Mm -hmm. to grow, and the mutuality of love begins to win your heart to be able to give and receive kindness and goodness and honor, there is a sense in which there are people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There are, again, this will sound so uh, uh, elitist, but there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to the, in this case, not Baal, but to the spirit, the religious spirit, Mm -hmm. which is not just a category metaphorically. Much of Christian faith, uh, I believe, is under the shadow of a form of rigidity and dogmatism and cruelty and self-righteousness and violence that whether it's coming in one form of uh, uh, no matter what it is, um, it always deprives the human heart of the true heart of praise and worship. So uh, all I can say, uh, my interviewee, <laughs> it's such a pleasure and honor to know that well after I'm off this earth, you will be standing against the religious spirit in all its form. And in that sense, I want to pray before we end. Thank you. And Jesus, for those who are standing against the religious spirit, who are being accused of indeed being people who are not of faith. Uh, And I pray now particularly for my dear friend, Rachel, uh, that her wisdom and her strength uh, and her capacity um, to playfully and yet so solemnly tell the truth will invite so many more to a level of freedom where indeed uh, our lives are about love. And so I ask for her protection. I pray for growing honor and freedom so that the work that she has done and others with her grow so that we are a community of praise. And we pray that all in your name, Jesus. Rachel, good to be with you. Thank you very much, Dan. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. 